Alrighty, folks. So uh, today it's the uh, the day after the day after the uh, last video that I made uh, on my uh, on this project. Um, enough has happened. The, the project is not done yet, but enough has happened since the last update that um, you know. Just even for my own records, I want to uh, make another update video. So I left off. Um, where I was transferring data from my uh, my primary file server Tesla to my backup file server Darwin for the first time. I was making the initial backup and I was using ZFS send receive to do that. Um, so I made a snapshot and I was copying the snapshot over and that was in progress um, when I last made my my last video. Uh, since then I've moved things around a bit so that I can actually you know actually sit at my desk. Um, so that actual send receive process took uh, a total of 25 hours to complete and that makes sense because uh, a scrub on Tesla would normally take 25 hours which you know reads data once for everything on the pool so sending everything on the pool not network bottlenecked should take 25 hours so the math works out so I had the data uh, moved over and I did exactly what I said I was going to do, and I destroyed the pool on Tesla, which still was, I mean, that's a terrifying command to write. Um, you know, Z pool destroy tank, that's just, ugh, I don't know. Uh, something about destroying your only copy production data. Um, even though you know you have a backup, it's still, still scary. So I did that, and I was debating in my last video whether I was going to use rsync or ZFS send receive to get the data back. And uh, I wasn't sure if send receive would change the way the data is stored on disk or whether I'd have to use rsync to sort of fix that. And uh, I chose to use rsync uh, partially because of that, but also because I wanted to change my data sets around. I wanted to actually um, create nested data sets and just sort of restructure the way it was done on disk. And in order to do that, you have to, um, you have to create the data sets that way and put data in them. You can't modify snapshots, right? They're read only. So ZFS send receive was sort of out of the question for that. So I set up an NFS share on Darwin, started rsync, and rsync copied files for about 30 seconds, and then it kernel panicked. So I did a bit of research, and apparently there's a bug in ZFS on Linux that if you try to rsync from a pool, it will kernel panic. So rsync was out of the question, and at that point, it was late at night, and I was like, fuck it, I'm using send receive. Well, this'll, this'll be the true ultimate test. So I started to send receive, I basically took the script that I wrote to get the data one way, flipped all the paths around and went the other way. And uh, that was actually doing really well. Uh, it was actually copying about 500 megabytes a second, like nonstop, it was going gangbusters, really, really, really fast, much faster than it had gone the other direction. And it was looking like it was going to be done in about 10 hours, which was what I sort of originally calculated I should have been able to do this in. All right, this is this sort of goes back to, I know that Tesla's ZFS implementation is really messed up because, you know, I should be able to get these speeds that I'm not getting. Um, but it was going, it was looking like it was going to be done in 10 hours. I went to sleep, of course, it was late. I woke up the next morning to probably around seven o'clock to get ready for work. And uh, I checked on the status and this this was actually still going. Um, it, it was I had about I think one and a half terabytes left to copy. So it was almost done, but it wasn't done yet. And uh, I noticed that the um, disk activity on both servers was basically nothing. The disk activity lights were just not on. And uh, I watched it for a while and every 30 seconds or so, I'd get maybe one or two seconds of disk activity, and then it would drop back to doing nothing again. And I thought this was very odd because I mean it was all very consistent up to this point. So I checked the, I mean it logged into both the machines. I checked CPU usage, that was nothing. Checked disk throughput, no disks were doing anything. The network, nothing. There were no errors anywhere, nothing like that. And it was still copying data, but it was incredibly slow and it was doing it in these bursts and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And uh, so what I ended up doing was I ran IOSTAT and IOSTAT is a great, great utility. It's part of the SysStat package, 
uh, in Debian-based operating systems. And it allows you to look at um, a lot of parameters uh, to do with disks from the kernel. Uh, a lot of stuff you can get in other places, things like you know uh, throughput in you know, bytes per second, read-write. Um, you can also view IOPS, uh, averaged over a period of time, or instantaneous. But the one thing that's really useful in IOSTAT is the queue length for each disk. So each disks have a queue. You can kind of think of it like um, a checkout line at a store, right? The cashier can only check out people so fast, and if more people want to check out than, you know, at a particular time, they queue in a line. Well, it's the same deal. When the operating system requests a disk do something, the disk takes a finite amount of time to actually return the data. So if you know there are multiple requests for data on that disk before it gets the original data back, they, there's a, a basically a queue that the operating system gives each drive. And you can actually view how long that queue is um, over an average period of time or instantaneous using IOSTAT. And when I looked at it, the queue length was basically zero for seven of the eight disks, as you would expect, because they're not doing anything. But the eighth disk had a queue length of 160 incredibly high by any stretch of the imagination. It was ridiculous. So clearly, I mean, there, there's your problem. That disk um, was being incredibly slow to respond. And uh, I basically cross-referenced the, um, the you know, dev SD letter designator with the serial number of the drive. And I looked it up, and it is the one used disk that I put in the backup server. So I mentioned in my other video, I, I, there's eight disks in there, seven of which I bought new, and one of them was a disk that used to be in Tesla, was kind of flaky. I did some tests on it, it seemed to be okay, so I put it back into service. And that disk now appears to have a problem. So I was really disappointed by this. Um, I mean, it wasn't that big of a deal, but uh, you know, the, the disk looked fine, and it, it, had, it had been fine for you know, the entire day uh, up until that. So you know, I thought, oh, maybe it maybe it just finally crapped out finally. So I was like, okay, I'll just leave the disk in. I'm not even going to bother to pull it out. Um, I'll you know stop in to my local computer shop on my way home or uh, on my way to work, and uh, I'll pick up a new drive. They're still on sale, um, and I'll just replace it when I get home. So I uh, I leave, go to the computer store before work, and I realize that it's actually not open yet. Uh, they open it. 10 instead of 9. So it wasn't open, so I was like, okay, I'll stop in after work. So I get to work, it's about 45 minutes after I left, and I SSH in, just to see how everything's going, and it's all back to normal. It's all 500 megas, megs a second consistent throughput now. And, you know, within a couple minutes after that, it finished. The All the data was properly replicated. So I thought this was really odd um, why this would have happened, and I looked at the system load graphs because I have Monitrix running on, on, on Tesla, and you can, uh, Monitrix is it's basically a, da a daemon that does a bunch of statistics and it generates web pages. And I can see the system load graph, and it looks like about three hours the system was in this sort of you know, state waiting on that disk, and then it resumed. And I eventually, I did a bit of digging, but I, I eventually found out what it was. Um, I basically took screenshots of the smart statistics on all those disks when I put them in the server, and then I cross-referenced those with the smart statistics now, and that disk has had a large number of reallocated sectors uh, just in the last you know few hours, and uh, that explains it um, because there were no errors, right? The disk actually did work fine; it just was very slow. So what I think happened was there was probably a bad section of disk, and when it got to that point in the transfer where it started reading that you know those bad sectors. The disk would have trouble reading a sector, and it would keep trying over and over and over again. And eventually, it would read the data correctly and go, "Okay, I need to reallocate this." It would map it to a, you know one of the spare sectors on the disk, mark it as bad, and then you know the disks would, of course, they you know finally the data would get returned. All the other disks would you know start pulling more data off. You'd get that burst of I/O until the disk hit another bad sector, and then it would try again, try again, try again, and it would keep doing this until it probably got past that you know patch of bad sectors. So I'm not going to replace the disk. I, I think it's flushed out most of the bad sectors at this point. Uh, I mean, bad sectors are not bad. Um, a lot of people think that, oh, if a disk has you know bad sectors on it, it's, it's garbage, it's unstable, all that stuff. That's not true. Um, dr all disks, uh, every single hard drive pretty much ever made has bad sectors on it. Um, 
it's just it's it's a process of manufacturing. Um, I remember way back. Um, this is a little bit bit of an aside, but I remember way back in the like you know the eighties and the nineties. You got discs. You know they were like you know they were in the megabytes. And when you bought the disc, it would have a sticker on it, a label that was basically made specifically for that drive. And when it was made, they tested the disc and they found, okay, it has, you know, five bad sectors. And they would write the address of those sectors on the disc. And then when you bought the disc, you would have to actually program those bad, those bad sectors into your disc controller so that it wouldn't store data there. So your capacity of the disk was actually, let's say, you know, 20 megabyte disk minus the five bad sectors was the actual capacity. And as disks progressed, they got bigger. They also had, you know, flash memory and stuff built into them on those little, on the boards on the bottom of the disk controller. So basically when they test the disks at the factory, rather than writing, you know, writing down the addresses of the bad sectors, they simply program it into the disk controller um, on the disk where the bad sectors are and tell it don't use these, use some spare sectors. And now disks are manufactured with a little bit more actually than a couple megabytes of spare sectors. Um, so when you buy a disk, it looks like it's got no reallocated sectors, but it actually probably has quite a few. Um, it just they're you know they were bad at manufacture time, so they're not reported to you in any way. You have no way of knowing where they are or how many there are. Um, and the, the smart statistic for reallocated sectors only really talks about reallocated sectors that are after manufacture, that are, you know, sectors that are determined in runtime after you've bought the disk. And some disks, uh, some manufacturers don't uh, even tell you about reallocated sectors properly. I know there are some firmwares that actually lie about the number of reallocated sectors. So basically, if the number, if the drive has a bunch of reallocated sectors left, like you're not out of um, spare sectors, don't really worry about it. If the number is continually increasing, the number of bad sectors is continually increasing in like a linear rate or an exponential rate, then yeah, there's a problem because it's probably not actually bad sectors. It's probably there's um, you know bad heads or something. But if you just get a burst of bad sectors uh, and you know nothing after that, then it's fine. I mean, I'm not worried about that at all. So anyway, so I had everything. Uh, copied uh, back. It took about 13 hours to copy all the data back, even with those three hours of basically not doing much because it's waiting on that disk. And this really sort of, to me, um, says that ZFS Send Receive fixed all of my problems. Because, like I said, um, you know, Scrubs took you know 25 hours, copying it off took 25 hours, but copying it back only took 13 hours and probably would have taken 10 hours if it weren't for that, you know, that three hour slow period, which is, you know, calculating it out, that's about the speed it should have been working at. So I'm actually pretty happy about that. So I think ZFS Send Receive actually did fix all the problems and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. So I'm not gonna bother to try and do this again with our sync at a later date. That's not, that doesn't seem to be necessary. Um, some other interesting things that I noticed. When I took the data off of Tesla, Tesla's pool reported a fragmentation percentage of 16%, which I thought was actually pretty good. And when I put the data back on Tesla, the fragmentation was 44%. So the fragmentation went up. And you'd think that doesn't really make a lot of sense. How is that possible, right? The fragmentation should go down, not up. And I looked into this and apparently, um, I mean, this also makes sense, Apparently, when I created this pool, fragmentation was not a thing. Like the statistic for fragmentation percent didn't exist in the code, and it was added in a later version of ZFS. So I think that that 16% was only calculated on a certain subset of the data. It wasn't calculated on all the data. So it probably was actually much higher than 16% fragmentation, probably higher than 50% fragmentation. Um, so 44 is probably actually a drop in fragmentation. It just wasn't reporting it correctly in the first place. So I'm okay with that. I, 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 I'm okay with, uh, with the, the fragmentation it's got now because the performance is really good. So that's all that matters. So uh, anyway, I did that. Um, I got everything back up and running. Um, everything was okay. 
nothing was uh, nothing complained about Tesla being offline for you know 13 hours all that stuff um, so I mean I mean I did all the remote administration from work actually I I, uh, I got it running as soon as I possibly could um, so anyway what I did the next uh, that night was uh, which was last night was I started a scrub on Tesla to see a how fast it was and B to and verify all my data was correct so I started that and uh, I woke up in the morning and it finished and it finished in under 10 hours so I mean the math works out again it's 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 operating at the proper speed and um, another note I'll make is uh, I mentioned before that I had pillaged one of the host bus adapters for SATA out of Tesla and put it in Darwin because I ordered an adapter that's not in yet so I have four disks running off of an adapter that's bottlenecked basically it really can only handle two disks so what I um, what I noticed was during the scrub when I ran IOSTAT, I looked at the uh, disk throughput. The disk throughput was equal across all eight disks, but the queue length was um, the queue length on all the disks that were you know plugged directly into the motherboard and stuff. They were um, you know two point five or whatever queue length, but the queue length on the disks, those four disks that were on that bottleneck controller were nine. So uh, clearly, um, the scrub was still bottlenecked somewhat by that controller. So. Uh, when I get the, the new controller in, I want to run scrubs. Uh, well, of course, I'm going to run scrubs. They're done on a, on a schedule with Cron. But um, I kind of want to do a comparison and see if it's actually even shorter than 10 hours, which is really nice. I mean, cutting down on scrub time is, is, is really good for a whole bunch of reasons. So yeah, that, that was an interesting thing to know. But yeah, it took 10 hours to complete. And when I got up this morning, it was done. I checked on it. And I have unrecoverable errors. I've lost data. What? Okay, so I woke up, I checked the status of the pool. In fact, I didn't even have to do that. My message of the day, I have a script that makes the message of the day show me my Z pool status uh, if there's a problem. Um, so I knew immediately, as soon as I logged into the server, I knew something was wrong. And I looked at it and it shows that there are four checksum errors on the RAID Z2 pool. It doesn't show the errors on a disk, it shows it as the whole pool has errors. And one of my files, was, un was unrecoverable basically, so I was, I was a bit uh, a bit disappointed in this. Um, actually, I'll show you the um, the output of uh, Z pool status right now. So um, I'm running another scrub. So I've done some stuff, but anyway, uh, I, I basically you, you know you, you get the unrecoverable error. Um, at this point, it was showing um, two errors for tank and four errors. It shows double for the actual um, RAID Z2 pool. And then it showed um, that I had one corrupt file. And uh, so I checked the file to see if it actually was corrupted. And yes, indeed, the file was corrupted. It uh, about halfway through, um, it was a video file, halfway through, um, I got an IO error. So it was indeed corrupted. Now, I was not really worried at this point because I have about four copies of that file across you know, Darwin now. Uh, assuming that the data was even valid on Darwin, it's very possible that the corruption occurred going from Tesla to Darwin and not Darwin to Tesla, which in which case there's two corrupted copies. But I also have a co-location server which has a valid copy and I have cold storage which I know has, ba has valid copies. So um, I, I wasn't worried that I was gonna actually lose, that I'd actually lost a file. But um, what I was intrigued about was um, why this had happened uh, and how to fix it because the file was corrupted in a snapshot um, and it was corrupted in the very first snapshot that I had sent back. So basically all the snapshots that had been automatically created from then on were also corrupted. And it appears that there is a way you can actually correct a snapshot by resending it if you have a copy of it, and I do on Darwin. Um, but of course, it's like a 13 terabyte snapshot. So I didn't want to, have to go through that all again. So what I did is I ended up deleting all of the snapshots on the machine so that uh, you know all of the references were gone. And then I deleted the file. And um, that's why it shows as just an inode number instead of an actual uh, file name, file path, because the file's actually not there anymore. I'm running another scrub, as you can see, to basically verify and clear that error. Um, so if I, I, it may actually, uh, let's see, what's the status? Yeah, so 
it's scrubbing very fast now. I mean, 650 megs a second, and I can probably get that faster with a new HPA. And it'll only take about eight hours, so I'm okay with this. It immediately jumped up the checksum count to 49 to 98, which is odd, um, but it hasn't reported any more unrecoverable errors. So um, I'm just gonna let this go and see what it does, and it will clear the error once, uh, once it gets there in the scrub. Now, I've checked Darwin, and that file is valid on Darwin, so the corruption seems to have occurred copying it back, not copying it to the backup server. So um, that's good, I guess. It doesn't really matter where the corruption occurred. Um, so yeah, that's that's all good. Um, so I'm yeah, I'm doing the scrub. Once this is done, this should be cleared. I can copy the file from a backup, um, put it in place, and then. Um, this is more of an inconvenience than anything else. I now have to destroy the um, the snapshot on Darwin and copy it back, all 13 terabytes, because I can't do an incremental backup now because I've destroyed the snapshot on one side because the snapshot was corrupted. So, yeah, so tonight, because it's going to take, you know, 10, 10 hours, uh, I can just do it while I'm sleeping. Um, so that's not actually that big of a deal. I'm going to use my Infinity Man network again. I'm going to get that all out um, just so that it's faster because I've calculated if I did it over Gigabit Ethernet, it would take about 41 hours, um, which is a hell of a lot worse than, than uh, you know, just uh, 10 hours. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that tonight and then I can start doing incremental backups the day after, assuming that it doesn't find any more errors, um, which I hope it doesn't. But um, yeah, as to why this occurred, I have absolutely no freaking clue um, because it's not attributing these checksum errors to any particular device. It's just basically saying the entire VDEV has checksum errors, which is very odd. And I, this isn't the first time I've seen this. And uh, you look online and nobody, uh, nobody else really knows why this occurs either. So it's not just me. Um, nobody really seems to know why this. I mean, there, there's theories, but um, some people say that this is due to bad RAM. Um, and I disagree with that because the probability of that is incredibly low. Um, I may actually make another video immediately after this, um, just addressing that sort of myth about ECC memory. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, that, that's the status of this. I'm, I'm still copying things and I've now had, now I have to do more copying than I expected. So this is going to take a little bit longer, um, than I, uh, than I thought. But uh, yeah, I haven't lost anything yet, and it looks like ZFS, when you copy stuff um, using send receive, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't maintain its original storage configuration. It sort of inherits the, the new properties and the new pool it's ending up in, which is really good in my, my case, because I can't use RSync. I mean, I could have used CP, or I could have you know, find another way to archive the data across, but I just didn't bother, so. Anyway, um, that's enough of, for this update. Um, I'll, I'll promise. I promise to give more, more information when when this is actually done. I'll actually properly edit a, a real, good video about this. But until then, um, this is just uh, all I've got. So hopefully that was uh, interesting. Thanks for watching.